I guess we're ready to go. Good. So uh, thanks for sticking around until 5.30. I know I'm between you and your beer, and I hear there's potatoes and stuff outside. So I will talk fast, because I have something like 148 slides. No, I'm kidding. No. Uh, 28 very quick s slides. It's, it's, it's a, I'll, I'll try to power through these. My name is Carlos Morales. I work at Intel in our newly formed AIPG group. Um, we've been around for about a year. And uh, we were formed out of the kernel of Nirvana, which is an acquisition until made about 18 months ago. Feels like 10 years ago at this point, but only 18 months. Um, and what Intel did is they pulled all these, you know, uh, numerous uh, AI efforts at Intel under one umbrella. And so we can harmonize across them. We can uh, uh, make sure that they all interoperate and all solve solutions, not, not just uh, point solutions. And today I'm talking about democratizing AI. And democratizing is, uh, I guess it's an overused term. It's a buzzword in Silicon Valley. Um, but I'm going to bring it to the ground for AI. First, let's talk about what Intel has been doing for, for in this space for basically since I was a kid. I mean, um, dating myself, but when I was a kid, I, one of the things I, I taught myself, the reason I learned computers is so I could use the punch cards. And you had to stand in line and you, you, know, you submitted a batch job and I learned PL1 when I was like seven or something. And along comes uh, Intel processors and they made uh, personal computers possible, right? Yeah, sure, there's a, you know, if you had an Apple II, you had a 6502, but uh, my first computer was an IBM PC Junior, which is also kind of embarrassing. Um, and that was just the first step. We did it for a very long time. Uh, Intel has been at this for, for a long time. We, the, we enabled and uh, fomented the cloud revolution by making it very easy to get to hyperscale. Um, and now we're right in the middle of the IoT uh, revolution. Right at the beginning, we're going from billions of users, which is already hard, to untold billions. Right? We're going we're to have multiple compute nodes per person on the planet. So how do you do that? How does Intel uh, scale from a few thousand developers to millions of developers and billions and billions of users? Right? You make it easier. Uh, you make it more powerful and easy to be more powerful, and then you make it accessible. So today, you know, when, when we talk about democratization, we could be talking about making it easy for the end user to get on this platform, right? We're developers here, so I'm going to talk about how you make it easy for developers to get on AI. All right, so what does that mean? What does it mean to democratize, I practice this word like 40 times, I still say it wrong, democratize AI for developers? Hello? Okay. Um, again, it's simple. You make it easy. You make it easy to be more powerful, and you make it accessible. Let's go into each one of those. How do you make it easier? All right. So about, I got into this game, the AI game, about three, four years ago, it seems like decades. And there was this great paper by Google uh, talked about the, it, was, it had a title like uh, uh, Technical Debt in Machine Learning. And their point was that, oh, I'm sorry. I really want that beer. Okay, so I skipped a little bit. So we're gonna talk about uh, making it easier by automating and abstracting, making it more powerful by scaling out and scaling up. Um, and making it accessible by bringing it to the platform that you already have. You have acres of compute. Let's put it to use. All right. So now I can launch into uh, my Google uh, paper story. Um, it was called uh, uh, Technical Debt and Machine Learning. And we still weren't really focused on deep learning back then. And what it was saying was that, yes, AI and developing uh, you know, machine learning and deep learning uh, models is quite difficult, right? It requires, at least back then, it required multiple, if you had two PhDs, you were ahead of the game. Um, 
you were reading papers all day. But what people didn't realize is that to make this work at a production scale, to make it work for everyone, you needed very complex systems. And a CSP has that by default. They have data engineering, and they have administration and user management and security. So if you use a ready-made system by one of the big players, you have all that. But that's not necessarily democracy. I mean, it's, you can pay for it, but that's always going to be a, a few huge players, right? So when I talk about democratizing AI, I talk about what I mean is you make all this stuff easy for everyone. If, if you have a, I don't know, a falafel shop and you want to write a program that detects good falafels and rejects the bad falafels, you can pay somebody at a big CSP to do it or I can make it easy for you to do it. So solve all these problems and, and you're, you're helping everyone. As I talk to customers, and one of the good things about working at Intel is they have a lot of customers, um, I realized that it was not this simple, right? You're usually bringing AI to bear on a problem that already exists and already has a solution. People have been working on analytics, machine learning for a long time. And what they're not looking for a whole, let's rewrite you know, my $10 billion worth of software. What they're looking for is how do you make this model that's 98% accurate 98.5. They're adding 0.5, which is billions of dollars to some of these guys, right? Uh, you save PG&E half a percent, and it's billions of dollars. And so what that means is we have to sprinkle AI into, and it sounds terrible, a little sp sprinkling of magic AI dust, but that's what they're looking for. They're looking to, to tweak models that already exist in their pipelines. It's a huge problem. There is no, I've talked to many CTOs, how do you solve this problem? It's like, you can't, don't even try. But there are some solutions coming, right? Um, and they all hinge on open source. Left to its own devices, we, you know, if you didn't do anything, the open source community would start solving this. Uh, if you look at the, the progress that's happening right now in machine learning, open source software that solves exactly the problems that I was talking about, it's happening. Um, when I started working on solving these problems, and that's what my team does at, at Intel, so AIPG solves all the, of, of AI. Um, my group is called Deep Learning Systems, and it's how you build systems out of uh, those components into something usable. When we started doing that, again, decades ago, back in 2017 or 2016, um, there weren't that many players. Microsoft was a big player, Google was a big player. Um, but that was about it in terms of making easy to use uh, deep learning software. And if you look now, there are dozens. So there are dozens of startups. There are a, a few big players that are all approaching this. We call it deep learning as a service. Everyone has a slightly different solution, which is great. That's how you figure out the right solution. You try, it every, you try everything. That's, Deep learning is, oh, sorry. Uh, open source is very good at that, right? It's, uh, you try everything, you fail fast, and the, the good stuff sticks. Um, recently, though, we're seeing a convergence. Kubernetes is the, the de facto API for, I call it an API because I just don't know what else to call it, for, for AI. So what we're seeing is, you know those big complex things where there's 19 different systems and some are Mesos and some are OpenStack and some are homegrown. Uh, the way they're gluing those together is they're standing up an API cluster, uh, a Kubernetes cluster, and putting all the new stuff in that. And AP, you know, the Kubernetes API is very clean. So from anything, OpenStack, anything, you can talk to Kubernetes. And here's a, I just put this in so the, our legal group hasn't looked at it yet. Um, I just, I just did a Google trend search on Kubernetes. And the trend lines are very telling. I mean, that looks like Tesla stock. It's, an, it's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, uh, very quickly becoming the dominant paradigm. And if you look at Kubernetes, it's really kind of a trivial system. It's a you know, few hundred, maybe 100,000, 200,000 lines of code compared to OpenStack's 30 million. So maybe this time uh, we will converge on a 
on an orchestration system. Okay, so that's how we make it easier, right? That's not enough, right? You have to make it more powerful. And what we want is, you can make it super powerful today. Like, if you go to all those specialized labs, there's a benchmark kind of war going where, oh, I trained in this many seconds. Oh, no, no, we trained it in two seconds less and so on. That's not so useful, right? Those are a bunch of labs. They're doing, they have acres of compute, they throw everybody off the compute and they do it themselves. To democratize that power, you need to bring it to, you need to make it easier for people to use it. So, um, Intel has been investing heavily in the scaling out of deep learning. It's not as simple as it sounds. Um, deep learning works on very small data sets relative to what big data people think. When someone, a big data person says a lot of data, they mean petabytes or exabytes, as we've been hearing today. If you say anything more than about a terabyte in the vicinity of a deep learning person, they'll freak out. Because it's so compute bound that processing a terabyte of learning data will take you months. So that is not the bottleneck. The, the data size is not the bottleneck. What happens is as you're training, these brains start sending all their information back and forth. It is not a massively parallel, embarrassingly parallel problem. So the bottleneck very quickly becomes, and again, I'm going to date myself here, it's Andal's law, right? The, the more information you have to send back and forth, the more bottleneck your network is going to be. So, so solving that problem is actually a math problem. It's, there's all these waiting algorithms where you say, okay, I'm going to guess what this guy's going to say, and he may guess wrong, and then you have to post wait. It's complicated. But uh, again, two years ago when I started, 16 nodes was right at the edge of uh, like the state of the art, soda. Um, now it's commonplace to, for people to use 256 nodes with almost linear scale. That's a minor miracle there. It doesn't sound like it, but it's a minor miracle. Um, and there are some papers coming out where we go to 3,000, 4,000 nodes. I can't afford 4,000 servers, but um, some people out there can. Um, so scale out is very important. Scale up is important too. And you scale up usually using accelerators. But Xeon has made some incredible strides in the last two years. Again, when I joined Intel, you know, Nirvana was a, I came from Nirvana. Nirvana was an accelerator company. So uh, Xeon, so we're going to. And in the same time that it took us to take this chip out and get the software running, uh, Xeon performance went up 127x, not 1.27, you know, is two orders of magnitude. And inference did better. So the difference between inference and training is uh, when you talk to Alexa and it understands you, that's inference. It's a very simple compute. Um, when you teach Alexa what you're saying, that's very complex. That's training. So, so you know, practically all that compute happens on CPUs today. Um, and this is actually getting, getting, getting traction. Real use cases, really complicated, difficult use cases are being solved using this acceleration. In this case, uh, GE um, had some, some inference problems that wouldn't fit on a, an accelerator. They came to us with a challenge. They said, can you uh, make it run at a certain frame rate? These are big, huge, like radiology images. And uh, we beat them by about, beat their, their challenge about 6x. And the key, there's a, of course, you use the entire stack, but the key component in that stack, stack is the deep learning deployment toolkit. You know, deep learning is a very, I know we're OCP, this is a hardware-centric kind of uh, conference, but deep learning is a special one. It's 50% software. Our group, AIPG, is more than, for an Intel group, this is kind of astounding, but it's more than 50% software people. All right. Your time's coming up faster. So, okay, um, so we talked about scale up and scale out. Uh, let's talk about making it uh, uh, accessible. So I already talked about how you can do deep learning on your Xeons. Um, and we're not stopping. The optimization will continue. 127 is snapshot from a few weeks ago. That slide is out of date, right? Our, our team is 
poor guys aren't sleeping much, which is good. Um, of course, we recognize that you can't do all of your deep learning on, on Xeon. So we are uh, uh, adding accelerators to that, and that's you know our puppy. Um, it's also very broad. It's, you, you don't only do training, right? You do really what you want is edge to edge. You, there's, a, there's something that you want to do with that deep learning. A lot of it is in the data center, but a lot of it is moving to the edge. So, you know, aut autonomous vehicles, smart cameras, smart drones, all these things are using AI at the edge. And you want a portfolio that supports that entire thing. And then end to end AI. Okay, so this all sounds simple. Intel is, is a very broad, a very ambitious company. They solve, you know, they, they play in every niche. Um, for AI, what's missing is tying it all together. So it's not just that we have a full stack, we have a bunch of full stacks, and making sure that the data scientist uh, has a clear path from training his data to recognize cats or falafels or whatever, to making a robot that can track down your cats and do whatever. Okay. So this is the traditional Intel slide. I used to be a customer, I, I, used, I worked at a, a network provider before uh, Intel. And when, when the slide would come up, I, my eyes would glaze over, right? Because, you, oh, look, you look up, you find your solution. Oh, yeah, I need a Xeon, and I'm going to use this framework in this library. Okay, they have it. Good. And then you go back to browsing or playing, I don't know. You know I'm out of data. I don't play on my iPhone anymore. Um, but being on the other side of this so recently, not 25 years, I've been here two years, um, I now recognize how hard this is to pull off, right? Having a slide that works for everybody, that shows, uh, that has a solution for just about every problem out there is incredibly difficult. And as a technical, I think it's breathtaking, the ambition that it takes to do this. Um, so everybody take a picture, find your, your path. Um, I have to talk about our, our, our baby. We call it the neural network processor. We announced it uh, late last year. Um, it is a, a dedicated, uh, purpose-built ASIC for accelerating deep learning. So um, it you know, is not only uh, massively parallel in, on, on die, it's, it's built so that you can build large clusters um, of them. The, the connectivity between these chips is one point something terabits plus. Um, so remember I talked about Amdahl's law getting in the way of distributing deep learning. With this thing, it goes away. It, well, it won't entirely go away. At some point we will hit some limit, but 1.2 terabits per chip is a pretty high limit. Um, and the software is designed to take advantage of that. So in, in, we're not taking some existing models and kind of retrofitting them into this distributed model. We are creating the software, the full software stack to take advantage of that from day one. Um, the other thing is the architecture is specific to deep learning, right? So any CPU or other, you know, like uh, processor is going to have a design point where you design, you, you kind of file off this bottleneck and another one pops up. Um, and System architecture is the art of getting rid of those bottlenecks. So everything bottlenecks at once, right? It's hard to do if you didn't start out by doing that for deep learning. So th this processor has HBMs on it, it has uh, internal networking, it has external networking, and of course processing. And it's all designed to bottleneck at once. Now, you can write a synthetic benchmark that will not do that, but that's a, that, as opposed to writing synthetic benchmarks that do saturate everything, right? The normal use, uh, the normal mode of operation for this ASIC will push all the, all the uh, systems uh, to the max. So that's our network processor, but it's not the only thing. You know, when we flashed up that big portfolio slide, we had um, FPGAs down there. FPGAs are a very important use case, both for training and for inference. Um, 
One of the things that's important for inference is having a very uh, 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 low jitter, uh, deterministic, uh, repeatable inference compute. And you know, FPGAs are very hardware-like in that sense. You can make them a bump in a wire and they'll just do the same operation, exactly the same number of microseconds every time. So they're, they're finding a lot of applications for friends of Microsoft have been using them and pioneering uh, the use of FPGAs for AI for a long time. All right, so that wasn't so bad, right? I'm almost, almost at the end, I can smell the beer. Um, we're democratizing AI, and to go over what we talked about just, just now, we're offering that edge-to-edge -edge AI uh, compute solution, right? But that's not enough. We're developing the AI community uh, and, and when I say open source, all the software that my group works on is by default open source. So, um, and in fact, a lot of it isn't owned by us. There are projects that external groups own, Google owns some of them, some are independent. And we spend enormous resources supporting those and contributing to those. Um, and then finally, you know, my job and the, the job of the other people who worked at AIPG is to make it all work together so that you have an edge-to-edge -edge solution that anybody can take advantage of. And with that, come on, I beat it by 52 seconds. Questions? I'm going to run models in my laptop. Very simple, right? And I want to use transfer learning because Somebody has already built the model. Mm -hmm. All I need a uh, good communication between the CPU and the storage. Right. Right. I'm just calculating the last level, fully connected layer. I'm not actually training. I'm using a ResNet 50. Right. So, is uh, given Intel's expertise about, you know, working with different stages of memory or storage, different, you know, distance? Are you doing something in, along that line? So that's. Doing transfer learning is a great example of something that helps. Uh, democratize AI because something I didn't talk about because of the beer is uh, the there's a lot of I'll get to your question in a second this is going to be a roundabout there's a you can democratize AI all you want but data is every you've heard it elsewhere data is the new oil Right. Everybody wants the data. If you own the data, you can create machine learning and deep learning models that help you dominate whatever market you're in. Something like transfer learning, where you're using somebody else's data to produce 90% of your functionality, and then you're layering your own data set, which may be much smaller, to customize that model to your application is very important for democratizing uh, AI. The bottleneck you're going to run into for transfer learning is not storage. Your laptop probably has a nice flash. Um, it's compute. And so even if you're only, because transfer learning, you're only computing a couple of that neural network's layers. It's going to be a lot le less taxing than, than trying to compute the whole thing. You're still going to use a lot of your compute. So uh, if this is something that you're interested in, you can come to our website, download the latest optimizer. If you're using TensorFlow, there's TensorFlow drivers. I suspected you would. That same graph for Kubernetes is uh, the graph for TensorFlow, which is one of the deep learning uh, frameworks. Um, and then you would use maybe our software, the software that we're contributing to open source like Kubeflow to string those things together more easily. All right, another question? You guys are all thinking about that beer. I am too. <laughs> All right, great, thank you.